And that's where we start this morning with that nor'easter. It's this morning almost 50 million people from Philadelphia to Boston could be walloped by this massive snowstorm. Could be the biggest to hit the area in nearly two years. In New England, they've been preparing for the past 24 hours with folks on the Massachusetts coast boarding up their windows while crews in Rhode Island lined up the plows. The big concern this morning is on the roads. All that rain and snow could make for a messy commute along some of the most traveled arteries in the country. And that prompted New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy to issue this warning. Please, if you can, we suggest staying off the roads tomorrow morning. And if you can, work from home. Tomorrow's a good day to do just that. Tomorrow morning is now this morning. We have full team coverage. Meteorologist Angie Lastman is tracking the winter storm. Just a few minutes, we're going to talk to Providence, Rhode Island, Mayor Brett Smiley about how his city is preparing. Let's begin, though, with NBC News correspondent Tremaine Lee in Brooklyn, New York. Tremaine, good morning. So officials in cities on the I-95 corridor in the Northeast want to make sure everyone is prepared. So what should you expect right now walking out the door this morning? That's right, Joe. It's uh, early in the storm already, but if you're trying to get to work on the I-95 corridor anywhere between uh, Philadelphia and Boston, expect 40 mile per hour gusts, whiteout conditions, which is a big concern. Now, if you're in Brooklyn here in New York City, uh, we're not at the, 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 the heart of the storm just yet. The rain is just now crossing over to snow, already pretty cold, already pretty nasty, as we heard some of those officials say. If you don't need to be out here, you shouldn't be out here unless you're a school kid and you're off from school and you get a chance to play in the snow or you're walking your dogs or running. Besides that, stay warm, stay safe inside. Tremaine, the worst of the storm is set to hit, as you said, in a little while, which then, of course, is going to mean it's right in the middle of the morning commute. We've already seen some flights being canceled, things like that. Tell us about other preparations. What are officials doing ahead of this storm? Officials are, are warning folks and urging folks, again, just to stay home. Uh, school kid, the, the schools, New York City Public Schools, the largest school district in the country, has already gone remote. Uh, you know, we've seen the, the, the plows out a little early, salting the ground. Hundreds of flights between the three major metropolitan airports in Newark and LaGuardia and JFK. Several hundred flights have already been canceled. And again, officials are, are urging folks, because in New York City, that the, 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 the heart of the storm will hit right during the heart of rush hour. So they're urging folks just to stay home. Yeah, and so, I mean, Tremaine, here in New York, we've seen something of a snow drought the yeah. last two-plus years, basically the last three winters. What's it actually going to look like here in New York? That's right. It's been a little bit of, of a drought, so I know some folks, not those of us who have to stand out here and report the news, are looking forward to this. But if you are a school kid home from school, uh, as much as uh, six inches or more in Central Park and across the city. And so it's been two years. Uh, the drought is finally broken. Again, the, the estimates are getting a little lower from last night, but six inches or more of snow dropping here in New York City. We will take whatever we can get for those of us who have been starved for yeah, snow. Yeah, I know. Over we're these sorry for you, years. Tremaine. <laughs> Tremaine, but thank we're you a so much. For Stay more, warm. For more on this, we're joined by the mayor of Providence, Rhode Island, Brett Smiley. Mayor Smiley, good morning. Thank you very much for joining us. So, your city bracing up for nearly a foot of snow here. How are you preparing for this? Yeah, we've uh, also not had a storm like this in two years, but uh, we're fully prepared and our crews have been out working since about 4 a.m. pre-treating the roads and uh, and pretty much everything is shut down in Rhode Island today. So no school, state offices are closed, city offices are closed, and we're encouraging everyone to stay off the roads to allow our snow removal teams to do their job and uh, try to get the city back in shape for tomorrow, Valentine's Day. I heard you talking <laughs> about that at the top of the uh, show, you know, Providence is the culinary capital of New England, and we want to make sure that everyone can go out for Valentine's Day tomorrow <laughs> night. So oh. we're uh, working as hard as we can. Love that. It's something to keep in mind ahead of this. You know, folks in the Northeast obviously are generally used to snow, but the last few years, because we haven't had much, usually the first time you go out there and drive doesn't go yeah. so well as maybe when you get a few other times under your belt. What are your biggest concerns as the storm settles into the Northeast right now? So if we can keep cars off the road today, then we will be able to do our work. What we really encourage folks to do is to check on their neighbors and uh, to be you know, a little extra neighborly and compassionate of whether people have mobility issues, they're elderly, um, to give a helping hand to make sure that you help your neighbors shovel their sidewalk and, uh, and just check on one another. It has been a little while since we've had a storm like this, almost two years, and, uh, and the city and state government does its part, but there's still a responsibility for 
for citizens to do theirs as well. And so, you know, it's a tight knit community here. And so we're encouraging everyone to just check on their neighbors and stay off the roads. And, uh, you know, unlike New York, this is not a distance learning day for our kids. Our kids just have no school today. And I think there's something to be said for a good old fashioned snow day for young people. And so fully expect the kids to be out sledding and doing things like that today. And then uh, we want to be back in business tomorrow. Absolutely. For people who maybe do need to get to work for whatever reason, what do you want people who do have to take to the roads to keep in mind this morning? Yeah, use a little extra caution. It's slippery right now. The snow's coming down pretty heavy here. Uh, we have fully transitioned into snow, and over the next couple of hours, we're going to see snowfall rates between one and two inches an hour, which is very heavy snow. And so please allow extra time. Uh, understand there's going to be parking restrictions throughout the city and throughout the state, really. Uh, if you're a, a frontline worker, whether you work in healthcare or uh, another care industry where you have to do that, that work in person, we're encouraging people to leave an extra half hour hour or more in their commute uh, to make sure that they can take the time that they need to be cautious when driving uh, and, and, and make a plan for uh, how they're going to get to work. All right. Providence Mayor Brett Smiley, we are thinking about you this morning. Thank you so much for sharing your plans with us. Thank you. I love to hear that kids are getting an old school snow day. How about that? So how much snow can we expect in the Northeast? Let's get a check on your morning news now weather. Angie Lastman's in studio with us. Hey, Angie, good morning. Hey, good morning, guys. Snow lovers are rejoicing across parts of the Northeast where we, yes, we have those winter alerts in effect for 46 million people, but we're already seeing some busy conditions uh, when it comes to the snow and still the rain. Here's the look at the, the radar right now. Notice that we're not all dealing with the snow. We've got Atlantic City basically south still dealing with some of that rain. But we have transitioned over into the snow in places like New York, stretching up to Hartford, out uh, over portions of Long Island. And we're going to see the snow stick around for the next couple of hours. Here's the timing in all of these places. Washington, D.C., you guys are going to wrap up that kind of steady snowfall pretty quick. You've really only got about an hour to see it from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. We'll see Philadelphia from about 8 a.m. until noon. And then as we look to New York, we do start to see things really wrapping up here when it comes to the steadiest of, the, of that snowfall uh, by about 1 p.m. So we go into our second half of the day, not a whole lot of snow going to be falling beyond that, but we still will be dealing with the gusty winds across this region, even through the rest of your day today. Moving a little farther to the north, folks in Boston, about 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Notice that does go a little farther into the afternoon, but still, it looks like at least the falling snow will be wrapping up by the time we get out for that afternoon commute. If you are one of the people that do have to go into work today, even Providence, places uh, that surrounding region about 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. is when you're looking at uh, that snow falling at a good clip. Here's the deal as far as the snowfall totals. These have changed a whole lot over the past couple of days. This was a difficult forecast. If we're honest with you as meteorologists, this was a tough one. We've got uh, some really warm conditions that have been uh, taking shape over the past couple of days, so our surfaces are very warm. The steady, the, uh, steady snowfall, though, looks like we'll pick up maybe three to seven inches in New York. We could see a little higher amounts as you go out towards Providence, four to eight inches there. Boston has seen these numbers come way down over the past 48 hours, two to four inches we're expecting there. And the last time we saw a significant snowstorm like this, we've got to go all the way back to late January of 2022. We had eight inches of snow in Philadelphia, in New York, and Boston picked up two feet of snow. So it's not going to be that kind of snowstorm for our friends in Boston, but it'll be impactful, uh, causing some issues on the roadways and such from places like New York to Providence. As far as the winds are concerned, that's going to be another issue here. I mentioned they'll stick with us through the day today. And here are some of those peak gusts, 25 mile per hour gusts in New York, Atlantic City, of course, closer to the coast. You're going to see those higher uh, wind gusts, 43 mile per hour wind gusts we're expecting, Washington, D.C., 38 mile per hour wind gusts. So even after the snow works out, when we start to get things under control as far as uh, the roads are concerned, we're still going to be looking at, at some coastal flooding concerns. This is what we'll have to watch for here as we go into the later parts of today, especially around high tide. We could see some of those uh, flooding concerns uh, along the coast for folks in this area. Notice that those onshore winds could push one to maybe two feet of, of inundation up into those locations. So this will be something that we'll have to watch for here as we go through at least the later parts of today uh, from Boston stretching down to Atlantic City.
city, guys. Otherwise, across the country, uh, we've got some nice conditions if you're looking for it. Mild for the plains. These temperatures across the plains, they are running way above average once again. Uh, and we've got another storm system that we're going to keep track of. It's moving down from Canada. It's a clipper system. That means it's a fast moving system from Canada. It is going to bring some folks a little bit of snow as we get into tomorrow across parts of the Midwest. And eventually, New England will see th those impacts too. But look at the lower third of the country. Oh, it's wow. bright and sunshiny. And I don't think people in Miami uh, are thinking about snow at all. Look <laughs> at that temperature 81 <laughs> degrees. And good news for our friends out in California too. They had, you know, a busy week oh, last yeah. week with all of that rain. They are looking dry and nice mm. and comfortable. Uh, just how they like it, right? That's why they, yeah. that's why they live there. That's why they right. live there. Exactly. The rest of the country is like, what's the fuss? What are you guys talking exactly. about? Yeah. Right. Any chance, Angie, in the northeast of power outages? I think, yeah. With the with those wind gusts, 30, 40 mile per hour, I mean, there's definitely a good chance of that. I don't think the snow, um, the weight of the snow mm. is as big of an issue as we oftentimes see it. But, but of course, there's definitely a chance of those power outages, so prepare for them. All right, something I'll keep an eye on. Thank you so much. Of course. Well, we are learning new details this morning about the woman who stormed a popular Houston megachurch, opening fire and sending churchgoers scrambling. New video shows law enforcement searching the home of the shooting suspect, ultimately finding some troubling items. A motive is still unclear, but police say they believe she acted alone. NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky has the latest on the investigation. <laughs> Chilling new details about the shooter at Joel Osteen's Lakewood Church in Houston, where gunfire Sunday sent members running for cover. They were repetitive. Boom, 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 boom. And I yelled, Mom! Police identified the shooter as 36-year-old Genesee Yvonne Moreno and say she was carrying an AR-15 with the word Palestine written on it. Police said they also found anti-Semitic writings during a recent search warrant. We have uncovered some items. We do have some anti-Semitic writings that we have uncovered during this process. But like I said, we are 24 hours into it. Investigators say a dispute between Moreno and her ex-husband's family, some of whom are Jewish, may be related to the shooting. At the church, witnesses say the shooter was wearing a trench coat and opened fire almost immediately after walking inside. The first thing that I thought that I was like, I need to hold my kids really hard, really hard. Um, and I thought that I maybe will die after that. Police confirming Moreno entered the church with her seven-year-old son and was armed with multiple weapons and ammunition. Two off-duty officers returning fire, killing the shooter, her son critically injured in the crossfire. They held their ground in the face of rifle fire at point blank range. And they continued to fire until the perpetrator was neutralized and they did not yield. Law enforcement records show the shooter had at least six prior arrests since 2005, including unlawful carrying of a weapon, which she pleaded guilty to, evading arrest and assault on a public official, which she pleaded to a lesser charge. Moreno's neighbors saying she filed a restraining order against her in November. Police adding in 2016, authorities placed Moreno under an emergency detention order. We do believe that she does have a mental health history that is documented through us and through interviews with family members. The shooting Sunday came minutes before the megachurch's Spanish service, where one member was wounded, but is expected to make a full recovery. We're devastated. I mean, this is, we've been here 65 years and have somebody shooting in your church. But, you know, we don't understand why these things happen, but we know God's in control. All right, our thanks to Morgan Chesky for that report. Breaking news this morning, senators on Capitol Hill have passed a foreign aid bill that will help Israel, Ukraine, and other allies. The $95 billion package passed by a vote of 70 to 29 after a rare all-night session. But in the House, Speaker Mike Johnson has repeatedly said that he has no intention of bringing it before his chamber. Many House Republicans oppose more aid for Ukraine in favor of increased security at the southern border. Well, Jordan is joining the U.S. in its calls against an Israeli invasion of Rafah. That's a city in southern Gaza. President Biden met with Jordan's King Abdullah II yesterday at the White House. It was their first meeting since three U.S. soldiers were killed in a drone strike at a military base in Jordan late last month. The two leaders discussed the ongoing situation in Gaza, including how to end the war and a plan for what comes next. They also addressed the growing concerns over a possible Israeli military operation in Rafah. 
We cannot afford an Israeli attack on Rafah. It is certain to produce another humanitarian catastrophe. We cannot stand by and let this continue. The major military operation in Rafah should not proceed without a credible plan, a credible plan for ensuring the safety and support of more than one million people sheltering there. NBC News correspondent Aaron Gilchrist joins us now with more on their meeting. Aaron, good morning. So this is the first time the president has appeared alongside an Arab leader at the White House since the Israel-Gaza war began. Tell us the significance of the timing of this particular meeting and what role also is Jordan playing behind the scenes? Well, timing-wise, Savannah and Joe, good morning to you. This is something that we've watched the key players in the Middle East, the countries that have a, a lot of influence, like Jordan, trying to make sure that they're getting out and, and gathering as much support for the ideas around uh, a, a, a pause or a ceasefire in the fighting there, but also the humanitarian crisis that is developing there. The Jordanian king is on a mission this week, first stopping here in the U.S., then going on to Canada, trying to rally support for what he's called an immediate ceasefire. The, Jord the Jordanians told us that uh, before this visit happened yesterday. And so that was a key part of the conversation that the Jordanian king had with President Biden yesterday at the White House. Of course, we know the administration has said that a ceasefire, an out-and-out -out ceasefire, is not something that it's asking for, but it does want to see a long-term a humanitarian pause, as the president referenced and the White House spokespersons have been telling us uh, throughout the last several days as well, while the U.S. is working on this deal that is slow to come together at this point, Savannah and Joe. Yeah, so Aaron, what are we hearing from the president when it comes to trying to get this hostage release deal? Well, the president is saying that his team is still working on it. You may remember, obviously, we had the, the, the first deal that happened back in November where there was a pause and a release of hostages. And now the effort is to get the remainder of the hostages released. But there's been uh, this back and forth about what exactly that might look like between the Israelis and Hamas, obviously, with the Qataris acting as an intermediary and the U.S. and Egypt Keep, keep partners in the effort to get this deal done. I want you to hear the president talk about this a little bit in his remarks uh, from the White House yesterday. Listen. The United States is working on a hostage deal between Israel and Hamas, <clears throat> which would bring an immediate and sustained period of calm to Gaza for at least six weeks, which we could then take the time to build something more enduring. The key element of the deals are on the table. There are gaps that remain. But I've encouraged Israeli leaders to keep working to achieve the deal. The United States will do everything possible to make it happen. And so the administration has told us that this deal is pretty much there. That was the quote we got from a senior administration official uh, over the weekend. We know that today the CIA director, William Burns, is in Egypt uh, meeting with the Qatari prime minister uh, and meeting with uh, his Israeli counterpart as well, trying to craft the final terms of a deal and, and get this across the finish line. Uh, Bill Burns was a key player in the first deal that was done. Uh, and so when he shows up, uh, we, we expect that potentially this week we could see something finally come together. Aaron, President Biden has publicly criticized Israel's plans in this war. We also saw some of that language coming from him as well as from Jordan. But we've not specifically seen Biden or any of his administration officials publicly support doing something like restricting aid to Israel or maybe imposing conditions on it. Have White House officials indicated whether we could be close to that point if Israel follows through with this specific planned ground assault on Rafah? So you heard the president say that he doesn't want to see a major ground incursion into Rafa uh, anytime soon, certainly without the conditions that would allow for the million plus people who were pushed into Rafa uh, as the fighting was going on in northern parts of Gaza uh, without having a protection plan in place for them. The administration at this point officially is saying that its policy on Israel has not changed, its support for Israel has not changed, but we do know that there are uh, through some uh, administration officials that there is uh, talk about a plan being at least put on paper so that the administration wanted to to restrict or put conditions on some of the aid that it's providing. There is a plan to do that. But 
Savannah and Joe, at this point, officially, the U.S. has not changed its policy uh, and its position on what Israel is ultimately trying to do, and that is dismantle Hamas. All right, Aaron Gilchrist, thank you very much. In the wake of threats that U.S. troops are facing in the Middle East, America's top military officer is speaking out. Air Force General C.Q. Brown, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, sat down with NBC Nightly News anchor Lester Holt. They discussed military relations overseas and Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin's recent hospitalization. Not since he went back into the hospital, but uh, you know, over the course of the past month, uh, well, even while he was in the hospital, had uh, good uh, communications with him. Uh, what I will say is I wish him a speedy recovery. Were you personally stung or disappointed by the way it went the first time he was treated and, and ultimately hospitalized? Well, I, you know, I know Secretary Austin high highlighted that uh, he felt he could have done better in, uh, in the communication. Um, again, from my perspective, the, the communication I had, the things I needed to do as, in my role as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, I, I didn't have any concerns. And I pressed him about those controversial comments by Republican frontrunner Donald Trump regarding NATO. What do you take of that? Well, we, we have an alliance, and we have a strong alliance. I, I think we, we have a responsibility to uphold those alliances. It's part of your role right now to, to reassure NATO that despite what they may hear, that the U.S. is still committed? The U.S. is committed, and that's, uh, you know, that's the uh, message I communicate. Uh, that's the message that's been uh, received. On Friday, General Brown visiting Navy ships just returning from the Middle East. Part of your job is providing the president military options. When it came to what we're seeing in the Middle East right now, what was the overriding requirement of, of, of the plans you, you came up with? Well, without getting into details, I'll just say that the broad areas that we, uh, we focus on is, is one, to deter um, um, any further aggression, not let the conflict broaden, at the same time, uh, protect our forces. Do you think Iran wants war with the U.S.? I don't know that they do. Having watched Iran operate, um, they will do things through uh, their militia groups and others uh, to put pressure uh, to, to achieve their objectives. At the same time, not looking for a broader conflict with the United States. And during this Black History Month, I asked America's top general about this video that made headlines where he spoke passionately right after the death of George Floyd. I think about wearing the same flight suit with the same wings on my chest as my peers and they being questioned by another military member. Are you a pilot? And you were in the Pacific Air Force then. What made you do that? Our youngest son on a Sunday called my wife and I, and he was really struggling uh, with the death of George Floyd. And uh, it bothered me as well. And uh, our son asked uh, me, uh, Dad, what is Pacific Air Force is going to say? And at the time, I'm the commander of Pacific Air Force. And so what he was really asking me, Dad, what are you going to say? Uh, had no intent for it to uh, go as broad as it did, uh, but I'm glad it did. I think it gave. Uh, uh, a voice to many, because they were feeling much of the same. And uh, I'm, again, I'm glad I, glad I was able to do it. And sharing with us his inspiration during his career, the legendary Tuskegee Airmen. You spoke at Shaw Air Force Base about the Tuskegee Airmen. What is it you want, as people look at you and your experience, what do you want us to know and think about? Uh, opportunity. Um, you know, I think... Uh, all I've ever wanted throughout my Air Force career is just an equal opportunity um, to compete and, and not judge me based on uh, the color of my skin, but based, judge me on the merit of my capability. And I think that's what all of our service members want. Uh, they just want an opportunity. I'm an ordinary person with an extraordinary opportunity. I want to make sure that I do everything I can to open a door for others. Our thanks to Lester Holt for that interview. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.